Romans chapter 12, page 1763 in the Bench Bibles. We'll read the verses 1 and 2, looking at both verses in the sermon. Romans 12, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. These, the very words of God, We'll consider together first 12 verse 1 and then 12 verse 2. And if I can go fast enough through these two verses, the third point is going to be the renewing of our mind with applications and examples. And we're going to have to have some time at that third point because that will bring it all together in a practical, applicable way. There are more words in these verses that we should consider than I can consider, so I'll treat a few of the words rather lightly. I'll also try to read the verses in such a way that I emphasize what are the main thoughts in the verses. So with that, let's get into it. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters too, of course, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your, and I don't like this version translation, spiritual act, of worship. I'd rather say reasonable service, which I'll explain shortly. That's the King James translation. So, Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, what's it there for? Answer, the book of Romans divides into three sections, sin, salvation, and now here, beginning at verse 12, service. So therefore, the sin and salvation sections are transitioning to the service section. I urge you, urge. That means I strongly encourage. Please take this very seriously. You can, I suppose, ignore it, but I'm urging you. Sinners who are saved are urged to also serve. After all, you have the privilege of being alive. You aren't saved and taken right to heaven. The life you're given is the mercy of God. I urge you to use it for God's glory and the good of others. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, Many of you know that in other languages, some of you know Dutch, there are words that are too big to capture in one English word. I think gezellig, for those of you who know Dutch, is one of those. The Hebrew word behind the Greek word here is really too big for the word mercy. That Hebrew word is often translated, King James and other older versions, in two words, loving kindness or tender mercy. I wish that it had been so translated here. 
in view of God's loving kindness and tender mercy. What loving kindness and tender mercy? Chapter 3, verse 20, all the way through chapter 11, 36 tells us, wow, what mercy on God's part. And then it goes on to offer your bodies. So now we're getting right down to where the rubber meets the road, where we walk with our feet and do with our hands. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now what jumps out here, to me at least, is the word sacrifices. In the Old Testament, they made many sacrifices, animal sacrifices that pointed forward to Christ. Christ came as the sacrifice that all the Old Testament ones pointed forward to, and now that Christ is ascended, we are his people, and our lives are to be sacrifices, but not dead ones, living ones. Now, there's something else in this that almost deserves mention, and I will. I grew up on a farm, and so it jumps out at me. Animals were most valuable at typically two or three years of age, the beginning of animal maturity when they could reproduce, give milk, etc. In the Old Testament, people were commanded to bring animals as sacrifices, two or three years old, depending what animal, in animals without blemish. That's a very important detail. God doesn't want seconds. When I was on the farm when I was young, we'd have to gather eggs, no fun with the broody hens that sat on the nest and pecked at you, even with their beaks cut in half. But we'd have to gather the eggs, and we would put those eggs on scales. The first were heavy enough, and there were no blood spots inside. We could see through a light if there were blood spots because we had to sell first. And seconds either had to be given away, thrown away, or sold very cheaply. Now, God asked for first as sacrifices, not seconds. And he's saying to you here, offer God your body as a first. Every single one of you has something you can do for God and do well. The amazing thing is just how different we are. I do some things very well and other things very poorly that others of you do very well. Offer God yourself. Now there's another thing here, more intellectual, but I mention it because it slightly irritates me. It's not obvious today why the Old Testament sacrificed. Well, maybe it is now that I've sort of explained it. But scholars have these theories of why not only Israel, but other sacrificed animals, and sometimes even children. And one of those theories, there's a half dozen or so of them, is called, and it sounds cute in Latin, do et dara, which means give to get. The idea is you give God a sacrifice in order to get something from God. I don't know what you think of that theory, but it strikes me as the truth is almost the opposite. It's because God gave first that we give sacrifices. June was the month in the Hebrew calendar of the Feast of First Fruits. That's what it would be about now in the Jewish calendar. Wasn't often observed, very few people went to Jerusalem for it, but it was one of their feasts. And the idea was the first fruits, the first part of the crop, it'd be the biggest and best. Maybe you can think of strawberries. They're coming into uh, vogue right now. And usually the first are the biggest and best. 
And in the Old Testament, they brought sacrifices to God, the biggest, the best, without blemish. That's all behind here in Romans 12, 1. And now it says, present your bodies now. No more animals and that kind of stuff. You, present you as living, not dead, living sacrifices. The challenge really comes down to something very simple. Give God your best. See? Present yourself as living sacrifices, holy, a religious word to us. The word holy meant simply set aside in its first meaning in order to be special and sacred and spiritual. That's the word history of holy. Holy and pleasing to God. In other words, my dear friends, a challenge to you from verse 1, and we'll have to move on quickly, is this coming week and into your future, present yourself to God, set apart, special, spiritual, sacred. And then it says this is your spiritual act of worship. That word worship makes us think of church, I suppose, even though the text is referred to bodies. Reasonable is a literal translation of the Greek word that here is called spiritual. And a literal translation of the word worship is called service. We're not talking about Sunday here. We're talking about Monday through Saturday. Present yourself to God. Reasonable, sensible, holy, spiritual life of service. Now, I just did what I wasn't going to do, spent too long in verse 1. Let's go to verse 2. Verse 2, reading again what I think it's building up to. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's just skip that last phrase and deal with the first part of the verse here. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. God's people are way too good at imitating worldly ways. Whatever the world is into, God's people can be. The world is into actresses looking pretty and skinny, then God's people can want to look pretty and skinny. The world is into athletics, God's people so easy are into it. And we're so easily led and misled by the news media, so easily propagandized to be like the world. The text is saying, be different from the world in the best sense. Reading again, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Now, there's a key word in these verses. That word transform is the same word that's used of Jesus, what we call metamorphosis or transfiguration very same word. In the transfiguration, Jesus on that mountain shone brilliantly and communicated with the heavenly realm, something very special, and yet he was recognizable. Be transformed. Now, at the risk of talking about something I don't know about, I'm going to anyway. Some of you here are very much more sophisticated than me in this. You know what transformers are. To my understanding, they do two things. Electrical transformers, you see them on telephone poles, you know, those donut things, and you've got them hooked uh, into your computers and stuff. Transformers change... Uh, 
uh, alternating current into direct current, at least in some cases, and they can raise or lower voltage. It's about as much as I know about them. But what the text is saying here is, don't conform anymore to the pattern of this world, but be transformed in the sense of lift it up. See? I used to work in a greenhouse, and oh, was it hot in a week like this past one, and inside it was 10 degrees hotter than outside. We had to take lots of water and salt fills because we were sweating so much in 110 degree weather. One of the things we did was take off tomato worms from tomato plants and step on them and squash them. If you don't do that, tomato worms become moss. Now, I don't happen to think those moss are very pretty, like some butterflies, where the larva stage transforms, transforms into a pretty butterfly, but it's the same principle here that's being referred to. Uh, transformed, changed for the better in a way that that which is ugly like a tomato worm becomes beautiful like a beautiful butterfly. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, if I were to point to one word in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that I would consider the key word or phrase, it's this, the renewing of your mind. And so we're going to pass on quickly to the third point of this sermon, which is the renewing of your mind applied in some practical ways. The Bible, you know, says that Christians are new creatures in Christ Jesus. In order to help you get the point, I'd like to begin by noting something I remember from 1964. If you remember it that long, you're not only old, but it made an impression. In 1964, I worked in a factory, furniture factory, and we'd listen to the radio. And there were different um, speakers and little programs from time to time, like on radio stations today. And here's one of them by a then author, I'm sure he's long gone, named Earl Nightingale, entitled The Strangest Secret. And I'll take a couple minutes to read it because I think it'll show you by way of analogy what a transformed mind is like. Here it is. George Bernard Shaw said, people are always blaming their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want and if they can't find them, they make them. Stop a minute. What good advice for all these people who are having pity parties nowadays about what color they were born or what's against them and so on. Going on. Well, it's pretty apparent, isn't it? And every person who discovered this believed for a while that he was the first one to work it out. We become what we think about. Conversely, the person who has no goal, who doesn't know where he's going, and whose thoughts must therefore be thoughts of confusion, anxiety, and worry, his life becomes one of frustration, fear, anxiety, and worry. And if he thinks about nothing, he becomes nothing. How does it work? Why do we become what we think about? Well, I'll tell you how it works, as far as we know, to do this. I want to tell you about a situation that parallels the human mind. Suppose a farmer has some land, and it's good fertile land. The land gives the farmer a choice. He may plant in that land whatever he chooses. The land doesn't care. It's up to the farmer to make the decision. 
We're comparing the human mind with the land because the mind, like the land, doesn't care what you plant in it. It will return what you plant, but it doesn't care what you plant. Now let's say the farmer has two seeds in his mind. One is a seed of corn, the other nightshade, a deadly poison. He digs two little holes in the earth and he plants both seeds, one corn, the other nightshade. He covers up the holes, waters, and takes care of the land. And what will happen? Invariably, the land will return what was planted. As it's written in the Bible, as you sow, so shall you reap. Remember, the land doesn't care. It will return poison in just as wonderful abundance as it will corn. So up come the two plants, one corn, one poison. The human mind is far more fertile, far more incredible and mysterious than the land, but it works the same way. It doesn't care what we plant, success or failure. A concrete worthwhile goal or confusion, misunderstanding, fear, anxiety, and so on. But what we plant is what will return to us. Now maybe you see the point without me even saying it. What Romans 12, 2 is saying with the words, transformed by the renewing of your mind, is you, new person in Christ Jesus, plant in your mind godly thinking. And then you will reap godly thinking and godly action. Your thinking will grow into action. See the point from the secular comparison? It's a very important point. Now I'd like to give you a couple of concrete examples. Well, I maybe should say, first of all, you have to know your Bibles. It's sad today how much Bible people don't know. But let me give you a couple concrete examples. The first is self-image. Years ago, we dealt with that more than we have in recent years, but I bring it up anyway. People suppose that they would have a good self-image. I agree. But a good self-image for the right reason. If you were taught atheistic evolution, then nothing became something, became a thing, became a germ, and over time became you. If you're nothing but a glorified germ, I can see why you don't have a good self-image. You know what God says? He made you in his image after his likeness. Think image. A photocopy image is said to be 90 to 90% as good as the original. In a sense, you are a high percentage more like God than like germs or even like animals. Psalm 8 says you were made a little lower than the angel. Should you have a good self-image? Yes, but not because of evolution, because God made you in his image. Plant in your mind that you were made in the image of God, a little lower than the angels, see? And that, that tends to grow and come out. Let me give you another practical illustration. And I choose this one because it's Father's Day. God's fatherly providence. You believe in it, don't you? No, I always stand amazed at Joseph, kind of a young fool, braggart, sold into slavery, all those years from age 17 till, what was it, 30 or 40 before he was exonerated by Pharaoh? How'd the guy survive it? He could have been killed every single one of those days. There must be a lot of spirituality in him we don't read about. But when he's old, Joseph says to his brothers, Genesis 50, 19 to 20, these words, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? 
you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Now the God who was the God of providence to Joseph is also the God of providence to you. So if you put into your mind God's providence and that God will provide and be reassured, then those thoughts and actions appropriate tend to come out. May I give you one or two more yet? Do any of you feel discouraged and downhearted from time to time? You probably do. We all have these times. I certainly do. Psalm 42, 5. Why, my soul, are you downcast? And that word downcast is like a sheep laying on its back. They can't get up on their own like horses can. Sheep will lay on their back, the gases will build up till their stomach explodes. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now for any of you who feel cast down today, put in your mind that you can hope in God. He's bigger than your downcastness. And you will yet praise him. And he is your savior and your God. See, that's planting God and not nightshade in your mind so that God comes out. Have you ever heard of the Cherokee Indian rite of passage? Father, when son is a teenager, brings him out in the dangerous wilderness with wild animals. Son has to sit all night, blindfolded, eyes not moving. In the morning, father takes off the blindfold, says, son, now you can see again. Son says, no wild animals, uh, animals attack me, dad. Father says, you didn't know it, but I was right there watching, right beside you all along. That's your God's providence, my dear friend, and if you're discouraged, and in down times, put God in. Let's, 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 let's leave it at that. I'd like to close this morning by reading a hymn I learned in Iowa years ago that comes back based on Ephesians 3, 20 to 21 which reads, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Here's the hymn. Uh, bigger than all my problems, bigger than all my tears, God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all my questions, bigger than anything. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all the shadows that fall across my back. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all my confusion, bigger than anything. God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Bigger than all the giants of fear and unbelief, God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. Bigger than all my hang-ups, bigger than anything, God is bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you for these two incredible verses we consider today. And now my prayer is that the pastor may have opened up, or as they like to say nowadays, unpack these verses in a way that your people go from this place of worship, having worship, but also being filled in mind 
<clears throat> with Romans 12, 1 and 2, ready to offer themselves as living sacrifices in the week ahead. For Jesus' sake, amen. <clears throat>